Hello, everyone, for all of you who are uh, able to uh, see our slides. Oh, uh, Mitch, can you go back to the first slide? Oh, yeah, the first slide, please. Um, just giving everybody a second to get brought in. Um, welcome to the Bioscience Pipeline and Innovation in Connecticut during the age of COVID. Um, this presentation and town hall meeting is being presented by BioCT, the Pharma Industry, and the Bipartisan Bioscience Caucus. And it is being hosted by Advanced CT and sponsored by Bio. Next slide, please. My name is Dawn Hosevar, and I am president and CEO of BioCT, and I'm thrilled to be here to um, introduce um, the folks that are going to be speaking today. Um, I do want to take a moment for a couple housekeeping issues. Um, thanking the BioCT's Government Affairs Committee. We meet on a monthly basis and talk about any issues, et cetera, with the legislature that will affect the bioscience industry. And uh, as you can see on this slide, we have many folks that represent the industry in our committee. Um, from Semaphore, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Regeneron, AbbVie, Bristol Myers Squibb, Rome Smith Lutz, um, Fiona Malone and La Sarcina, Oringer Ingelheim, Yale, Alexion, Rome Smith Lutz, Yukon, and CSL Bearing. And thank you all for uh, being part of this. Next slide, please. And a uh, special thank you to the Bioscience Caucus chairs for helping us organize this today. Senator Christine Cohen, who represents District 12, Senator Tony Huang, District 28, Representative Jonathan Steinberg, District 136, and Representative Dave Yaccarino, District 87. Um, and as you can see, this is a bipartisan uh, committee, and I believe there are approximately 30 legislators in total on this committee. Thank you all for supporting this industry as you do. Um, so now, um, is Kevin Burke on the line? Mitch, if Kevin Burke is here, you could let him on, please. Um, in the meantime, I will uh, um, just like to say also, I would like to introduce um, Advanced CT and um, David Campbell, who is here today. David, would you like to say a couple words about uh, the mission of Advanced CT? Yes, thank you, Don. Thank you to you and BioCT and to my colleague Mitch for helping. Advanced CT is the private sector partner to the Department of Economic and Community Development, the DECD. We operate statewide to recruit companies and technologies to the state. And we also work on retention and expansion, which is to say meeting with companies in Connecticut on their business operations. Bioscience is absolutely one of the state's biggest clusters and most important clusters. And so we're delighted to once again be able to partner with Don and host this webinar. We thank all the speakers for sharing their time and expertise. And we're happy to hear from everyone who knows about a potential investment lead or a company that might want to consider Connecticut for investment. We're very happy to provide A to Z concierge service. Thank you, Don. Back to you. You're very welcome. Thank you, David. Um, if I forgot, I also want to thank Bio, the uh, Bioscience um, Innovative Organization out of Washington, C Washington, D.C., as they are a sponsor of this event today. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce John Houston, President and CEO of Arvinus, who will take over from here and introduce speakers, et cetera. Um, thank Great. you. Th thank you, Don. Thanks very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased to be uh, chairing this session on the bioscience pipeline and innovation in Connecticut in the age of COVID. And we have a number of uh, excellent speakers who are going to describe uh, what their companies do and their institutes do, um, and uh, certainly what they're uh, achieving uh, through this period of time where we're in a pandemic, and how their companies and institutes are actually uh, working through that and at the same time trying to find uh, therapeutics uh, and, and, and ways forward to actually tackle uh, the, uh, the infection itself. I want, I want to introduce the speakers in the next slide. And um, some great speakers here. Uh, Doug Mannion, who, uh, MD, who's the chairman of the board, CEO of Cleo Pharmaceuticals. 
bug has um, a, a huge reputation in the field of infectious diseases, having worked for many years at Bristol Myers Squibb and prior to that at uh, GlaxoSmithKline, a truly impressive uh, scientist and leader. And he's going to talk to you uh, about his company, Clio, but also give a sense of what's happening in the space of uh, COVID in Connecticut. Uh, we also have uh, Jit Banerjee, uh, PhD Associate VP for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the uh, University of Connecticut. He'll take you through all the great work that the University of Connecticut are doing uh, to tackle COVID. And then uh, last but not least, Bijan Almasian, PhD, co-founder, president, and CEO of Carrigen Corporation. Again, another company working its way through uh, uh, to be as productive as possible at time of COVID and also focused on ways of tackling uh, that area. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have each of the speakers, and I'll start myself, just give an introduction to the companies. And then we'll move into a set of uh, questions around COVID and the impact on industry, biotech, and academic uh, in, in Connecticut. And then we'll take questions as we go through the session. Next slide. So I'll start uh, with a, a, a brief company overview uh, around our Venice. Uh, Arvinis is a, a biotech company uh, focused on protein degradation. Um, protein degradation is very different from inhibition, which is normally what you see with uh, compounds. And we don't inhibit uh, proteins that cause disease. We actually get rid of them, uh, harnessing the cell's natural protein degradation process. The company was, was founded in 2013 uh, by Dr. Craig Cruz at Yale University and has been uh, a, a leader in the space of protein uh, degradation. We were the first uh, protein degrader company founded, and now several in the space, and a lot of big pharma companies working in the space. Uh, but we uh, continue to believe, keep the lead here in uh, Connecticut and in New Haven. We have 160 employees in New Haven area and growing. Uh, and quite a significant number of those are lab-based, and uh, you'll be pleased to know that they're all back in the labs working, even in the situation with uh, the pandemic. And we'll talk about how each company is managing to do that. Uh, we have a platform-enabled pipeline of oncology and neuroscience programs, including the first two Protax, and these are the names we give to these uh, degrader molecules, Protax. The ARV110 uh, is in um, uh, clinic right now for men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. The ARV471 is in patients uh, with ER-positive, HER2-negative, locally advanced, or metastatic breast cancer. And we also have a number of neuroscience programs uh, where we deploy a brain-penetrant uh, Protax to target tyopathies, alpha synucleinopathies, and other neurological disorders. We have a number of significant partnerships uh, with Pfizer, Genentech, and Bayer. And we also have a joint venture uh, with Bayer in the agrochemical space with a company called EarthBio. So we're very pleased and happy to be based in, in Connecticut and working in, in New Haven. And we're very focused on making sure our company stays productive all the way through this period of time with the pandemic. And I'll come back to you later as we talk about uh, how companies are managing to achieve that. But now I'll ask Doug Mannion to give an update uh, and a review of his company, Clio. Uh, thanks, John. Great to reconnect with you and thanks to the organizers. Um, so I left Bristol Myers Scribd in 2016 and I was looking for a cool company that, uh, that I could uh, join. And I was delighted to meet David Spiegel and to learn about Clio. And I joined as CEO in May of 2017 and, and haven't regretted for a minute. Um, so Clio is a targeted immunotherapy company that develops fully synthetic bispecific therapies. We call them arms and mates. I'll describe those both in a few slides, or a few minutes rather, uh, but the, with the goal to redirect, enhance, or replace antibodies. Uh, we were founded by Dr. David Spiegel, a full professor of chemistry and pharmacology at Yale University, and his friend Roy Prieb, um, with whom he studied at Harvard, uh, founded in 2015. Um, Two rounds of uh, financing have been closed, a Series A led by Biohaven out of New Haven that closed in September 2016, and then a Series B that I led uh, with Peptidream, a company with whom we have a research collaboration out of Tokyo uh, in 2018. Uh, $34 million of equity uh, raised to date, including Biohaven, Peptidream, and Connecticut Innovation, as well as several high net worth individuals, many of them Connecticut based. Uh, 20 full time employees, about half of them in the lab half office based. And what we've done is um, we prioritize the, uh, the hardscape for the lab employees. So if they're in the lab, they're distanced and they have all the appropriate uh, safety measures, but if they're not in the lab, then they actually are using our office space to further uh, social distance themselves. 
Uh, we're in the process of raising a 30 to $70 million Series C financing round as I speak. Uh, we're both a platform and a pipeline play. We have uh, an asset that is designed to enable in the US called KP1237, which is an anti-CD38 antibody recruiting molecule. What antibody recruiting molecules do is they redirect endogenous polyclonal polyisotypic antibody to basically convert antibody destined to recognize another antigen against the antigen of choice, in this case, surface express CD38 on local myeloma cells. Uh, two separate indications being sought initially, one in the post-transplant space in combination with Dana-Farber in Boston, and the other one in a more traditional systemic administration uh, in Darslex relapse and refractory patients. But with the advent of COVID-19 and the elucidation of its, of its genetic and pertinent structure, we were able to rapidly pivot our, our um, synthetic chemical discovery process such that we've been able to discern multiple high affinity anti-COVID-19 binders that we're now integrating into three different uh, therapeutics. Um, we, we have a deal with Peptidine, as I mentioned. We also have research collaborations with two allogeneic NK cell manufacturers, Green, cell, uh, uh, Green Cross Lab Cell out of South Korea and Cellularity out of New Jersey. But also we just received a $5 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to um, accelerate our COVID-19 therapy program, which is extremely exciting. Thank you, Doug. Then we can move on to Jit uh, Baji at uh, UConn. Over to you, Jit. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jit Banerjee. I am very new to UConn. I've been here only about four months. I'm very glad to be here and, and thank you again for inviting me. Um, so today what I wanted to do was um, through the slides and as we go through our conversation, give you an update about uh, UConn, uh, both in terms of what we were doing before COVID hit us and then also to give you an update on what we have been doing since the COVID uh, pandemic and how the university has positioned itself and how we are dealing with innovation and commercialization. So this is more focused on, um, on driving economic um, maintenance, economic growth, as well as um, uh, the innovations that we are doing. So this is a very brief uh, snapshot. Uh, most of you are familiar with the technology incubation program at UConn, uh, which is located in Farmington and Stores, and soon to be opened in Stanford. And this is a vital partnership between our uh, UConn researchers, faculty, uh, as well as students and also uh, other companies that come into this incubator. So we are excited to report that in 2019, uh, we started 15 uh, new UConn startups. Uh, these uh, UConn startups raised about $5 million uh, we have been very active. Uh, these companies have been very active in submitting uh, SBIR uh, grants. Uh, through our Yukon Innovation Fund, we have uh, awarded four Yukon startup companies to continue their uh, research programs. Just to give you a sort of an update on the uh, technology incubation program companies, it also admits and hosts a number of non Yukon companies. Uh, we currently have about 46 of them. Uh, that employs about 193 full-time and part-time employees. The companies have gone out and raised about $263 million. And um, the one thing that has happened to us, for which we are very grateful to the uh, city next and the state, uh, is uh, the funding that we have received uh, for our Stanford uh, Technology Incubation Program. The total amount is about $2 million. And uh, that will be dedicated to opening up the Stanford campus uh, for the uh, technology incubation program in 2021. We are working towards that. Um, next slide, if I may go. Or um... yeah, so then yeah, thank you. So then yeah, we'll come back to to um, Jit when we talk about the uh, the impact on. Uh... Um, COVID-19, but I'd like to int uh, introduce uh, Bijan Almasian, who's the uh, uh, founder, president, and CEO of Carigen. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Don, for your invitation. Uh, I'm Bijan Almasian. I represent uh, my colleagues at Carigen. At Carigen, we developed uh, immunotherapies and vaccines uh, for infectious diseases as well as cancer, including a vaccine for COVID-19. We started the company to, uh, with two professors from Yale School of Medicine, Professor Jack Rose and Professor Mike Roback. 
Dr. Rose is also the inventor of our platform technology, which is called Avidio, which stands for Artificial Virus for Infectious Diseases and Immuno-Oncology. Uh, we have built a portfolio of products, uh, four products in pipeline uh, based on this platform. And we have 10 employees. Uh, uh, I'm glad to report to you that all these 10 PhD scientists come from five different continents, including seven countries in the world, all educated and trained in the US as well as biotechnology. I have worked in biotechnology companies over 30 years in four or five different bio uh, uh, cities, including Boston, as well as San Francisco, Maryland and Princeton, as well as uh, Connecticut. Our company has been uh, sponsored by Connecticut Innovations. We would have not been here without the uh, investment of Connecticut Innovations and the, the uh, mentorship uh, and uh, their support. We also operating over the last four years at the TIP facility, a part of UConn. TIP is one of the best places that I have uh, worked as an incubator. It uh, fosters uh, collaboration between uh, entrepreneurs as well as academic laboratories as we have done. We recently made an announcement, have had a press release regarding our co-development of immunotherapy for colorectal cancer. We are also to, uh, uh, basically to, uh, working uh, very closely with Yale, uh, two great institutes, Yale and UConn, to develop a portfolio of products. And the next slide is, uh, uh, shows our portfolio products. Our business model is to develop uh, immunotherapies. These are our different products, uh, uh, stem from the same platform technology, Avidio. Uh, with, uh, in colorectal cancer, we work with uh, uh, UConn Health, uh, with the, uh, the CARG uh, uh, for the ovarian cancer. We work with uh, uh, Wayne State University, uh, with the former Yale professor who started this work uh, a couple of years back. We also uh, recently started working hepatocellular carcinoma with Professor Jack Rose at Brown University. Doc, uh, I'm sorry, not Jack Rose, uh, that Jack Rose from Yale, uh, John, uh, uh, Jack Wands, who is an expert in liver cancer. Uh, and also, to, we are working to, uh, with the uh, uh, Yale, as well as uh, UConn, developing a vaccine for COVID-19. I will explain why our strategy is different. There are 25 uh, vaccines in late stage of development. Uh, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca are developing these vaccines and they are moving very fast. Uh, we have uh, no intention to catching it because we can't. Uh, so we have a different strategy. Uh, we will know by the end of October, mid-November, the readout, which is the percentage of infection for these vaccines. We're monitoring the data and their progress very well and they try to see how we can improve on what they are developing. Thank you, John. Thank you. And thank uh, all of you for the, those introductions uh, uh, this, this afternoon. And I want to switch to some of the questions um, that we have for the panel and, and a really significant one to start with uh, as we try to deal with uh, COVID-19. And the question is, how are biotech and pharma and the academic institutes such as UConn continue to work effectively through this ongoing pandemic? And what approaches are the CT-based companies and institutes taking to tackle COVID-19? And I'll ask Doug Mannion to, to maybe start by giving his view of uh, what's happening in Connecticut uh, from his infectious diseases uh, perspective and also uh, where Clio is going in this space. Thanks, John. Come next slide, please. So I, you know, it's, it's interesting to be an infectious disease doctor in the time of the times of COVID, uh, it's kind of a two-edged sword. So I give out an awful lot of free advice, including what I'm doing right now. Although, you know, you, I get what you pay for when it comes to advice, I guess. But this slide really kind of simplifies uh, a tremendous amount of data and a tremendous amount of information that we've all lived through. So on the left of this, of this single slide I have to describe, Connecticut's uh, state response to the pandemic is basically a timeline from the first case on March 8th right through till basically now. 
And I'm sure all of you in your minds can recreate this for yourselves. It's probably not a, it's probably a good exercise for you to go through. Um, I recall that the week of the first week of March, uh, things that have already begun to shut down in San Francisco and California. Uh, very clearly, this was, uh, you know, was going to be a global pandemic and was not saying restricted to Asia. Uh, the first case um, in Connecticut was, was on uh, Sunday, March 8th. I remember convening a meeting of my senior leadership team on the Monday, having them begin to, begin to emergency plan, assuming that we need to shut down in the next two weeks. Um, the first case in our building uh, in Science Park was actually on the, the following Sunday, the 15th. And I actually opted to shut down our, our operations that afternoon on Sunday the 15th, uh, convened my team on the Monday, and then we immediately put together a plan for, for how it is that we were going to continue as an essential service to continue to be able to advance our science for the, for the, the betterment of patients, uh, despite what was going on. Um, that's a microcosm of things that were going on at the state and federal levels. Um, Connecticut has done disproportionately well, and we're, we're reaping the benefits of having a state that has, I think, passed the uh, societal stress test much better than most. So if you go to the Washington Post on a daily basis, they put together these very, very informative but simple graphics, one for the country as a whole and one for each of the states and the, uh, and the District of Columbia. And what it is is basically a chart showing the number of new cases normalized uh, per 100,000 population, including the trend over the last seven days. And there's four representative graphics that I want to show you here. The first is California in the lower left. So California saw this coming. Obviously, there's tremendous interactions uh, between Asia and the American West Coast. Uh, I think it's a, it's a government that uh, was prescient in terms of beginning to close things down, both the state government as well as municipal governments, for instance, in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. But San Francisco also had the advantage that in the springtime, it's when weather was cool and people were outdoors more. And so they got a little bit complacent. And in fact, they saw a significant uptick when the weather got warmer and people started to congregate indoors in air-conditioned buildings. They saw a significant increase in the number of cases. But still, they had time to be prepared and they were prepared. Compare that to New York that got slammed with the, the virus actually coming to them not from Asia, but from Europe. Uh, and we're less well prepared with a huge spike, but the response was pretty extraordinary, such that they dampened things down within a span of two to three weeks. And then I guess further contrast that with Florida, uh, which had the advantage that, uh, that uh, California did in terms of seeing this coming, knew that with the warmer weather, people would be congregating indoors, and, and quite frankly, did not adequately prepare, nor did they have in place the right restrictions, such that they had a massive increase in the summer months from which they're still recovering. So um, we in Connecticut on the upper left are kind of a hybrid, to be honest with you, between two different groups that got it right, New York and California. Uh, we were not slammed as hard because we don't have the population density, although Fairfield County was hit pretty early. Uh, but the response from our state and local go uh, um, uh, governments was exceptionally good, such that within uh, three weeks of us beginning to close down, we had already reached an R0, which is the interperson transmissibility rate uh, of below one, which meant that, in fact, invariably, if you can keep R0 below one, you'll burn out any epidemic because each new case only infects less than one case. So by definition, mathematically, it will burn out over time. The big question that we have is what does the future hold? So as fall approaches and cold weather, people will begin to congregate indoors again. That increases the risk of transmission. Schools are reopening, albeit at a very safe rate. Uh, and the government, to their credit, has held off on what they call phase three reopening, which would basically be a near return to normal. And that has been held off indefinitely to see how we all do in these, in these uh, early months of the, of the fall. So uh, to date, the state has done an exceptionally good job that has given businesses like ours a, a shot at being able to stay open and continue to produce. Next slide. So I already mentioned quite a bit about how we responded, but uh, you know, this is a cloud that has some silver linings for biotech companies. So uh, when I joined the company in May of 2017, although we were spending an equal amount of our discovery energies on infectious disease as well as immuno-oncology applications, I had opted to go all in just for immuno-oncology in 2017. But with COVID-19, we've been able to pivot back to our roots in infectious diseases. I'm an ID doctor by training. Uh, and we very rapidly were able to put together 
um, multiple synthetic chemical high affinity binders to COVID-19, which we are allowed to then leverage in a process that we call mating or monoclonal antibody therapy enhancers. So our claim to fame is that we're a pretty clever company when it comes to synthetic and medicinal chemistry. Uh, we had discovered a process a couple of years ago to be able to take therapeutic antibodies, be they monoclonal or polyclonal polyisotypic uh, therapeutic antibodies like uh, intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG, and to covalently bind to it a moiety, be it peptidic or non-peptidic, but always synthetic, that could actually redirect the antibodies against a different antigen or convey a different functionality. For instance, we can convert a monoclonal antibody like elatuzumab into a CD3 binding and activating bite-like bivalent agent. So our CEO, our CSO rather, Luca Rosselli, got the idea of mating IVIG several months ago. And with the, the advent of COVID-19, we could apply it. So you may be well aware of a, a treatment being assessed and now has emergency authorization in the United States called convalescent serum, where you take the plasma of individuals who have survived COVID-19 and who have uh, high levels of antibodies against the virus. And then you give it either to prevent people from contracting the disease as a prophylactic measure, or to people who are in the early stages of infection to, to modulate how severe the disease is. So this is a time-tested and true approach it's been used for a very long time, including in the 1950s in the US by the US government in Korea. Um, and it is known to work, and there's been uh, some intriguing results uh, showing that it does work in the case of COVID-19, but there's all kinds of issues in terms of scalability with you harvesting plasma from people who are recovering from COVID-19. So we have um, uh, invented an approach called hyperimmune globulin mimic or HGM, where we take intravenous globulin from healthy volunteers and we chemically convert it into synthetic convalescent serum, thus removing all of the scaling issues in terms of accessing drug, having appropriate uh, appropriately homogeneous affinity and, uh, and uh, antibody titers. And so we pitched this to the Gates Foundation in uh, uh, March of this year. They fell in love with it, immediately began committing funding to this. We have $5 million in with a commitment for them to fund the entire ride. We're in active negotiations with all of the producers of commercial IVIG around the world because that'll be the substrate that we can use to then do our chemical conversion. And it is anticipated that this could be um, a very useful approach, both as a therapy as well as a vaccine-like moiety, because among the attributes of our approach is redirection of uh, IgG2, and IgG2 has as one of its facets that it actually uh, uh, creates kind of a memory effect by our immune system that conveys to it a post-therapeutic or vaccinal effect. So watch the space, we intend to be in human testing as early, no later than the first quarter of next year, but ideally uh, later on this year. And we think that this could be adjunctive to the good work being done with monoclonal antibodies as well as therapeutic vac or prophylactic vaccines. Thanks, uh, thanks Doug. Uh, very, very exciting and uh, very innovative uh, approaches getting taken by Clio. Um, um, Jed, do, do you want to uh, then now talk about uh, Yukon and uh, the approach that's being taken there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I have two slides, uh, and uh, this is our response to uh, COVID-19 crisis that Yukon has been dealing with. As you know, that you know, when we all got hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, organizations went into a sort of a recess to assess the situation, uh, take preventative measures, and then um, then design how they're gonna come out of it in, a, in the new normal. And uh, UConn has been um, very, very good in maintaining the safety, security, and uh, in a thoughtful manner, bring, bring up uh, the workforce as well as students, uh, including opening up uh, some of the facilities. So one of the things that we did uh, was uh, safely open up the technology incubation program. And part of it is um, to help with economic maintenance. When you have a shutdown and people go into uh, sort of a mode of uh, not knowing what to do, uh, and then they come back, there is a lag time. And that's what we are doing with this uh, companies at Yukon uh, TIP program to help them come back with the maintenance program in a thoughtful 
in a safe manner so that they can go up in their, in their uh, production mode or go up in their uh, uh, development mode uh, very, very quickly. So that is one thing that we have done. The second thing that we have done is uh, we have partnered with the community. Uh, as you know, that one of the companies, uh, Connecticut Biotech, we have licensed to them uh, a, a fitted mask technology uh, that got a lot of publicity recently with the governor coming uh, in not too long ago. Um, so this is another, um, another effort from UConn uh, to show our engagement uh, with a local biotech company to come up with simple solutions, but very effective solutions. The next we did was we looked inward and we, we wanted to make sure that we have enough funding for our, for our um, innovation. So we, the, the Office of the Vice President of Research um, now has a fund, which we call it the COVID Rapid Start Fund, that is mainly focused on funding innovative research in COVID-19. It's our investment from the UConn for internal programs. Uh, two of our uh, tip companies, uh, one is Carriage and you'll hear from Vision not too, uh, not very soon. And other is the IMSTEM. These are the two companies that are working um, in, in developing therapeutics and vaccines against the COVID-19. So we are very proud of that. And finally, you know, uh, what we also did was partner with the, with the local, um, with the local agencies uh, and we became a part of understanding how others are dealing with it uh, along with the life science working group you know they have a COVID-19 task force we participated in that we also did a number of virtual panels to understand the best practices so it is like you know very thoughtful and methodical way of approaching uh, how we can contribute uh, towards um, this COVID-19 pandemic can I have the next slide, please? Now, um, as the university went into a shutdown mode for a little while, innovation doesn't stop, as we all know that. And I wanted to bring to you uh, a couple of examples uh, of some of the things that we have been doing in terms of innovation. And uh, one of them is um, a diagnostic. And so I brought a couple of examples. One is in the diagnostic, and, um, and this is with uh, the School of Engineering. Uh, Professor Baram Javidi, he is partnering with the School of Medicine uh, to come up with a low cost uh, photonic sensor for testing uh, COVID-19. And uh, we believe that this would be a real time test. Um, the second one is in drug discovery, uh, where we have uh, Dr. Dennis Wright from Yukon School of Pharmacy and Sandra Weller from the Econ School of Medicine working on broad spectrum uh, small molecule in inhibitors. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Tony Vella, uh, who's working with Yale University on ubiquitin uh, E3 ligases on uh, SARS COVID for pathogenesis. And we are also working on the structure of the SARS COVID proteins. So we are attacking all, all the things that you need to from a scientific point of view. The clinical translational front, uh, we have uh, work going on with um, Dr. Bruce Liang, who is the Dean's uh, School of Medicine, uh, in an open trial, um, a randomized trial, using pyrimidol plus standard care versus the standard care in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And we are working with the Jackson Lab uh, and the Yukon on seroprevalence of COVID-19 in healthcare providers. So, what we have been doing is we are not just partnering among the schools, but we are partnering with the other organizations to bring the science forward. And, and as you know, UConn has 14 schools and our greatest strength is our partnership, just not within the, within the schools ourselves, but also with different partners. So I wanted to bring that to your attention and uh, happy to continue this discussion. Thank you. Um, Bijan, do you want to talk to uh, your perspective on, on this uh, key question of how um, certainly your company and maybe others are working their way through the, the pandemic? Absolutely, we'll be happy to. Uh, if you, Mitch, go back to the slides showing Carriage's pipeline, please. I can't see the slides, are we there? 
Yes, you're, you're there. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Among the products that we are developing, one is for a vaccine for treatment of patients chronically infected with hepatitis B virus. Uh, we have been working on this project almost seven years in collaboration with uh, Dr. Rose at Yale and also Dr. Roback at Albany Medical College. Dr. Roback used to be a professor at uh, Yale as well. Uh, this is one of the toughest uh, viruses because there are a lot of uh, vaccines being developed for prevention of this uh, virus, but there is no cure for HBV. Uh, we have a combination of drugs that manages the virus, but there is no uh, immunotherapy or uh, small molecules to eradicate the virus. So we have learned a lot uh, from the HBV program. Of course, it has been uh, 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 sponsored by National Institute of Health, uh, the multi-million dollars that we have received, and also Professor Roback, who also received uh, multi-million dollars R01. We have been working on this, and we are applying a lot of knowledge that uh, we, we gained from the development HBV, and we applying it for the COVID-19. Basically, there are 25 products uh, in latest stage uh, by major pharmaceutical and biotechnology company developing vaccine for COVID-19. Majority of them are based on messenger RNA as well as uh, non-replicating and replicating viruses. The front runners, uh, runners are Moderna and Pfizer and also to, uh, AstraZeneca. We're monitoring the data and progress and uh, we will have the data uh, from the thesis studies that each one of them, at least they are enrolling over 30,000 patients globally. The endpoint is a percentage of the infection between the treated uh, patients or volunteers and the volunteers who have received placebo. There are a number of uh, challenges ahead. So we, we don't know which one will work. Moderna, messenger RNA, it has been around for a while. So Moderna has been in business for 10 years, and none of the products have gone through FDA approval, including working on the Zika virus for uh, a number of years. So this is their first uh, product that they are pushing it, and they're putting a lot of efforts. That's the same thing with the Pfizer messenger RNA. There are a number of different issues about this that we are looking, we're not trying to do the Me Too or to try to do the same thing because we are too late to develop a Me Too. There are 75 additional laboratories and companies in the world have, uh, they're working on COVID-19 vaccines in preclinical stages. So what are the issues? One issue is basically, uh, is induction of antibody is sufficient to protect uh, us from getting infected? Does the antibody or T cells are required for endurance of the uh, basically protection? We don't have the data yet. There are some partial data. Uh, does the, uh, because we need to have a vaccine that at least protects volunteers uh, like a flu uh, uh, for a year. There are major issues about the storage of some of these many of these products are being stored at minus 80 degrees. And that's a very uh, challenging uh, marketing and logistic issues for these companies because a lot of parts of the world, they do not have the minus 80 degree refrigeration. So there needs to be uh, definitely a additional modification of this vaccine or formulation to see if we can store it at least in minus 20 or maybe refrigeration. The other issue is the uh, issue of the prime boost uh, and uh, uh, pre-existing immunogenicity of the, because some of these uh, vaccines are adenovirus and we're all, in, uh, many of us are uh, infected by adenovirus and we have pre-existing immunity to neutralize whatever the, the vaccine we get. So these are the challenges that we're addressing. The other one that our platform, a video is, is, um, is capable of doing it is, is just one antigen of surface antigen, not surface antigen, spike antigen is sufficient for protection. In our study of hepatitis B virus, we realized that there are three major antigens in HBV, surface core and polymerase. As we increase the number of the antigens in our vaccines, 
we increase the, not the amount of the T cells as well as the basically our ability to clear the markers of the surface antigen or HBV. The, and our technology allows us to be able to use multiple epitopes of the uh, spike or other antigens that may help with the T cells that prevents the basically the, uh, the infection of the vaccinated individuals. Basically, this is uh, John, at the term, in terms of the strategy, these are our strategy moving forward. That's great, and thank you very much for, for that insight. Um, as a reminder to people who are um, listening in, if you do want to ask a question to the panel, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to, to write in a question, and we'll uh, track that, and we'll be able to hopefully answer in real time. Um, and while we wait for that, a, a second question really relates to the fact that, you know, we're now six months into the pandemic, um, what, and, and you're hearing some of the things that have been done to either get people back into work in the biotech and uh, university environment, and also working on therapy therapeutics. A question to the panel, what, what more can be done? Is there, is there more that you see could be done in terms of interaction with the, the state, the local government, uh, with other partners? What other elements do you feel could be done uh, more effectively uh, for the next uh, several months? And maybe Doug, uh, open up with, uh, with you. Yeah, thanks, John. So the, uh, I mean, it's not like a broken record, but I, clearly more of the same. So whatever the state can do to reduce the, the kind of ambient temperature of transmission in, in, in our state is going to help us keep our, uh, to keep our businesses open. Clearly, uh, to continue to do the very good work that's been done in terms of availability of, of tests uh, and robust contact tracing, the state of Connecticut is amongst the leaders uh, in the country in terms of availability of tests, especially for uh, for um, asymptomatic individuals and for very robust contact tracing, and that's been key to the success so far. So they need to continue to double down on those very basic efforts. Um, be beyond that, I would say the obvious that even before the pandemic, there was a critical shortage of available lab space, for, especially for small biotech companies, to be able to, to, um, to expand. And, and clearly now that we need to further socially distance, that puts even more pressure on scant uh, laboratory space. And so I would think any investment that could be done even now in terms of expansion of that would be, would be well received, certainly by companies like ours. And then um, assuming that this is going to eventually blow over, because of course it must, uh, then we'll also um, you know, see the bottleneck that still exists in terms of our, our transportation infrastructure challenges. So uh, clearly we need better airports throughout the state. We need better train service, especially along the, uh, the shoreline and up to Hartford. Uh, and so continued investment in terms of that will uh, make this a, a, an even more attractive space for people to move their families and for people to be able to go uh, on the kind of the hub between New York and Boston. Right? I mean, we're a logical step halfway. Uh, you know, we should be significantly uh, taking advantage of that reality, geographic reality. And Doug, just related to getting people back into work, I know certainly at Venice, the um, we, we did all the things I think every other company eventually were, were doing, which is uh, getting office-based staff at home, lab-based staff at home initially, gradually getting them back in with the, the best um, spacing you can make in the lab. So thin, thinned out labs, looking at different schedules, um, and also doing temperature checks. The, the one thing I would think would be, would, you know, we'd like to see is um, uh, more facile uh, ability to get testing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that, again, that largely gets left to the individual company to try and source and work that out. Uh, any thoughts about uh, that? And that, would that be helpful for, for you and Cleo? Uh, yeah, so we, so we acquired our own test early on. I mean, the beauty of being a biotech company is that you, you can do that. We also gave uh, access uh, uh, to all of our employees for one of the early, more validated serological tests. Um, but, but yeah, and, and you know, I, I have been tested, I think now something like five times just because I've had some healthcare issues. And I tell you, the, uh, the setup in uh, the Yale setup in New Haven is spectacular in that it's, you know, you can get an appointment within 24 hours, get results within 12 hours. Uh, so I, I personally have seen no constraints, nor have any of the, the, uh, the folks on my very, very small team. Uh, but of course, larger companies and your company is eight times larger than mine. Uh, you know, again, you get into issues into issues of scale. But at least 
for me so far, we've had a couple of people who've come into contact. We've been able to get them tested uh, very quickly and to get results quickly such that they would need to remain needlessly quarantined yeah, if they could go back to work. Thanks, Doug. Um, Jet, from your perspective, uh, what more could be done? Um, so I think there are a couple of thoughts. Uh, number one is uh, we would like to continue with the innovation that is very uh, important for us. And I think in science, we all know that, you know, we stand on each other's shoulders. So par partnering with, uh, with different universities, Yale and Jackson Lab and others is an important part to our mission. So that is very important. The second thing that I, I think would be important is um, continuing the economic maintenance. Uh, it is, so people, people usually get back into a mode of uh, not sure of what they want to do and how they want to do it. And giving them that assurance that, you know, we will in a safe and wise manner continue to help uh, with your mission uh, and continuing that across the state is a good way of reassuring the citizens of Connecticut that, you know, the, the state is behind, uh, the universities are behind, and uh, they can go back to uh, their work safely. The third thing that, you know, uh, would be very important for, uh, in my mind, would be assuring the small businesses uh, what they can do. Uh, and that can come in form of grants that can come in front of uh, economic relief, because they kind of form the basis of our economy. Uh, we, we have been talking about cities, we have been talking about uh, going back to work, which is more, uh, more concentrated uh, where there's population, but large part of Connecticut is rural. And I think we need to start thinking about uh, those areas, whereas organizations, as well as academic institutes, we have influence, uh, and as the state, they have an influence. The large part of the economic growth and economic stability also comes from that. It's just not Hartford and, and New Haven. So it is a combination of multiple uh, factors that needs to play in, uh, and uh, I and UConn would be would be delighted and uh, would play a front and center role in all this. Brilliant. And, and Bijan, your perspective? I, more I, that can be done? Yes, uh, we'll be happy to. to Basically, we live in a uh, blessed state based on the uh, Yale University and University of Connecticut. There are hundreds of in intellectual property IP being uh, uh, generated every year. I think uh, Connecticut Innovations and UConn are playing tremendously in the growth of a small startup company. As I indicated, we would have never existed and many other small biotech companies if we did not receive pre-seed seed. Of course, it's been very uh, tough road, uh, but persistence in terms of entrepreneur, it's a quality that you must have. Um, so we, we, they, we have been receiving those uh, support. Of course, we have received the uh, NIH grant. I think the state uh, government uh, and state uh, officials supporting the Connecticut innovations and providing them with additional funding. And the same thing with UConn, uh, because they are really supporting a lot of small biotech. Uh, we benefit tremendously from UConn being at UConn. Uh, the other suggestion that I have and request that I have is the, there are major VCs, biotech VCs in the state of Connecticut. I request and uh, sort of beg them to invest in uh, unknown entrepreneurs. Uh, professional managers build good companies, but entrepreneurs build great companies. Uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that they could uh, really build companies like uh, Alexion. Uh, Yale could be definitely and can be a major player. Yale has the second largest endowment uh, of academic institutes after Harvard so with more than $31 billion and return on investment of 5.6% every year in the last 10 years. So extremely intelligent people managing that portfolio. Investing a fraction of that uh, uh, endowment in the companies that have been generated uh, or been established based on the IP of the Yale and UConn can generate Alexions. 
in decades to come and imagine the impact of the economic impact on our society and, and the globally and in our state of Connecticut. That's all my, my uh, requests and, and comments, John. Yeah, well said. I see Dawn on screen. So Dawn, do you have uh, questions that you can relate to the panel or commentary? Um, yeah, well, what I'd like to do, if we could take a moment, is, as I mentioned earlier, the Bioscience Caucus chairs helped to um, support bringing this event to everybody, and I believe a few of them are on the call. So if Senator Cohen, Senator Huang, Representative Yaccarino, and Representative Steinberg could unmute themselves and uh, show your video, please. Um, we'd be happy to uh, hear from you and your support of this industry. Hi, Dawn. Uh, this is Senator Cohen. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you, John, for uh, doing such a terrific job moderating uh, this event. Um, it's just been fascinating to learn more about our, our Venice as well as Clio, everything that UConn um, has to offer and uh, Kerogen, just all making incredible strides. I, I am Christine Cohen. I'm the 12th District Senator uh, representing Brantford, Guilford, Madison, uh, North Brantford, Durham, and Killingworth. We seem to have um, somewhat of a, uh, a bubble of uh, bioscience companies in my district, which I love, enjoy very much. I am, uh, as Don mentioned, co-chair of the Bioscience Caucus. Uh, I also uh, am the Senate Chair of the Environment Committee, Vice Chair of the Commerce Committee, and sit on Children's as well as uh, Planning and Development. And just want to want to thank uh, BioCT Pharma and Ad Advanced CT for collaborating with us and putting this terrific event together. Each one of you, or Venice, Clio, Kerogen, uh, Yukon's in incubator, as I said, just fantastic. And I know I share in this excitement uh, with my colleagues hearing about the important strides you've made and how far you've come in such a short amount of time. It's just amazing. Uh, so together with my co-chairs of the Bioscience Caucus, uh, Senator Wong, uh, Representative Steinberg, and, and Yaccarino, we've all been watching intently uh, as innovation occurs at, at lightning speed across the industry, particularly as of late, uh, as we've just heard in the COVID arena. Um, and the possibility of what is to come provides so much hope in a time of a lot of fear and uncertainty. So I myself have such gratitude uh, for the dedication to discovery and, and solution and know that it's this uh, grit and, and determination uh, that will lead you know, to a, a healthier Connecticut and a world with early diagnosis, proper treatment, and even uh, prevention through vaccines. So I, I just think the, the breakthroughs we witnessed as a result of you know, Connecticut company-led scientific initiatives are tremendous. And you've really put our state on the map as one worthy of uh, distinction for the sector and its growth potential as a job creator and leader in life sciences innovation. So we, we really just wanna see your continued growth and enable you to thrive. So um, please just always feel free to reach out if you think we can help you from a legislative standpoint. I know uh, Dawn's in contact with us all the time and we'd like for you to, to keep us updated as she does so well of, of what you've got coming down the pike. You know, the Bioscience Caucus is designed solely for this purpose and, and we work very closely with BioCT, Advanced CT and uh, DECD of course uh, to support these efforts. So thank you. Thanks for all of your contributions. Well, thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Senator Tony Huang. I represent the 28th district. I share the co-chairmanship with uh, Senator Cohen. I, I want to take a moment to thank BioCT, but most importantly to all the scientists, uh, as you offered a unique perspective on the innovation and the passion and pursuit of excellence. That, that you all undertake. Um, in learning in, in our role, the incredible work that you all do, it, it's, it's inspiring, but also con so beyond complex for us as legislators. Um, sometimes you go way above our head, but what I wanted to be able to reiterate and translate to people watching this as they get beyond the science of this 
is as I look at BioCT and, and, and our pharma technology area, it is all about improving people's lives. It's a, about creating opportunities to create solutions for the health challenges that people encounter in their daily lives. So for me as a legislator, my support and advocacy for what you all bring to life is, is not just simply the science, but the quality of life standard for everyone in our state. So in light of that, I, I, I am very encouraged that we can say to the rest of the world, not just this country and state, that we have some of the forefront leaders in innovation and solutions on this COVID pandemic. And I think it needs to be repeated. And for us as Connecticut residents in support of Connecticut companies like yours to understand that you are creating solutions to get us out of this COVID pandemic. And, and I can't say enough to reiterate how powerful the statement that is and give Connecticut residents such a source of pride. And, and for all of you that just gave the presentation, I, I would hope that and encourage that you go back to your fellow scientists and researchers and support staff to let them know that for us as legislators in the state of Connecticut, the work that you do are essential, critical, and life-saving. So I'm here to support you, and I hope that we translate what you do so that the general public understand how it will positively impact their lives. So thank you all. Um, thank you for teaching me so much about this and also giving me an opportunity to support you in, in making lives better for everyone in the state of Connecticut, if not this world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave Yaccarino, North Haven, Connecticut, 87th District. I'll be very brief. Um, echo the word. <laughs> Excuse me? We're looking at your steering wheel. Yeah, I'm in, oh, I got to reverse it. <laughs> I'm in my truck. I, anyway, you don't need to see me, but you can hear me. That's the main thing. I'm walking to a meeting in a minute. Um, I've been a supporter of the scientists since I've been a legislator for 10 years. I remember when I first kept pushing bioscience and science in Connecticut, some of the fellow legislators, not this group, would think I was crazy, but it's so important to have science for jobs, of course, really help healthcare. And with the COVID and the pandemic, even more so now than ever. So everybody in the science community and this BioCT, we have to continue to work and I wanna thank you all. It's always a team effort, but science through the life of our world has moved us forward and kept us safe. So thank you, and I'll be a huge supporter as always. I, I, I always have been, and I think our caucus will also, and that's all I really have to say. So thank you, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully be back with everybody and work together for a better Connecticut and a better country and a better world. Thank you all. Science thank all you. the way. Yeah. Thank you. I have to go, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, so thank you very, very much, Senator Cohen, Senator Huang, and uh, Representative Yaccarino. I don't believe Representative uh, Steinberg is on the call right this moment. So again, thank you all for your support. It's, it's very needed and very heartfelt. And uh, I, I know the community is, is appreciative to know how much that the legislature is backing the growth of this industry. Um, I also would like to thank John Houston of our Venice for moderating this panel, um, as well as our presenters, Doug Mannion, Cleo Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Benjiri, um, Yukon, and Bijan Almasin, Kerogen Corporation. Um, please keep doing the great work that you are doing. And BioCT is here to support you um, at every way that we can. Um, I just want to let all the audience know that this has been recorded. You can see a, uh, a copy of this um, when we um, post this. And this is an ongoing webinar series that we are doing in conjunction with the legislature. So the second webinar coming up is in December. I believe it's December 8th, if I'm not mistaken. And that's more focused on the pharma end of the pipeline in this industry. So once all of this intellectual property um, is proven, then pharma um, does a lot of the commercialization, scale up, et cetera. So really looking forward to hearing from Pfizer, Boringer Ingelheim, and Bristol Myers Squibb, and pharma um, in December. So with that, I thank you all very, very much for being here today and hope you found this informative.
on behalf of BioCT, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.